Do you know God is Savior? This one was quite interesting because I like to sit and think about what I've been taught regarding these topics as I teach them and think about you know, when have I heard a sermon on this topic before? What have I heard taught on this topic before? And where do I stand on this? You know, what, what might be controversial about it maybe or what might be applicable to our lives? But the first thing that I came to when I thought about, you know, God is Savior, I thought, well, who is the Savior? That was the first thing I thought of. Because when you hear any message on Savior, the first person you think of is Jesus. Right. That's what I thought of, too. I was like, I'm preaching a sermon on God is Savior. Not Jesus is Savior. Okay, what's the difference? There's a huge difference, for one. They, a huge difference in the fact that they both operate in completely different roles as Savior, which is fascinating. And so we aren't going to go deep into Jesus. We're going to look, about, look at more in the first part of this message what God's role was in Christ being Savior. How is God Savior in the midst of Jesus being Savior? We look at some texts about Jesus, and we think about some of the birth texts, and this one is great. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. We all know Jesus is Savior. In fact, you ask anyone on the street, who is the Savior? Well, okay, that could be a bad idea. You might get some really weird answers. But ask anyone who's ever been to church before, and they say, who's the Savior? Who is Savior? Let's leave out the definite article and be vague. Who is Savior? They'd say Jesus. So tonight, we need to see God as Savior. Do we know He, God, is Savior? Do we know He is Savior? And what does that mean for us to say that God is Savior? Frankly, if we have Jesus in a position of exalted status in our lives, we think He is the only Savior because we've been taught He's the only Savior. And so now we're putting God up as Savior as well. And in your mind, you might feel like, wait a second. I, I don't want to take that role off Jesus. I don't want to take anything away from Jesus here, you know, because he is the Savior. He's the only one, the only way to heaven, the only one who saves. But now we're going to look at this nature of God, this attribute of God as Savior, and it's not in any way going to diminish who Jesus is. It's not going to take anything away from Jesus. In fact, when we understand God as Savior, when we know him as Savior, it makes Jesus even better. Okay, it exalts Jesus even higher because we see how the relationship works together. We, we know we, things we refer to as God, as we refer to God as Lord, we refer to God as Father, we refer to God as Yahweh, we refer to God as Almighty, um, as Jehovah. We have a lot of names that we refer to God as, but not very often do we call God Savior. But tonight we are. We're going to call him Savior. And in order for him to be Savior, we have to ask a question. How did God save us? How did God save us when Jesus is the Savior who saved us? Jesus saved us from our sins. So Jesus is the Savior. So how is God Savior when Jesus saved us from our sins? Ephesians 3 gives us a great place to start. And then we're going to jump over to Acts and you're going to see some pretty awesome things in the book of Acts. So in Ephesians 3, you see a text that if you aren't paying attention, you will gloss over this and it won't mean, it won't catch your eye because it's, it's merged into this paragraph so fluidly, so perfectly that you'll read over it and pass by it and not even realize the significance of it. So look at what it says. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. 
right away, Paul's giving credit to God for being a minister of the gospel through God's power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to make known or to preach, excuse me, to the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. Now, wait, we're about to get this part, so make sure you don't miss it. We're building up to it. He says, my goal or my purpose is to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, to make plain to everyone the administration or the working. Okay, they're, he's administering, meaning he's giving it out. Okay, the mystery. He's administering the mystery. He's giving out doses of the mystery, if you will. Which, look at what he says about the mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. So what Paul is proclaiming about the unsearchable riches of Christ is a mystery, but it's been hidden in God for ages past. Okay, now here here it comes, verse 10 and 11. His intent was that now through the church... Okay, through the church, through the redeemed people, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That's a pretty powerful statement, too. That's not the one I'm going for. It's, very, it's 11. We're getting to 11. But this mystery through the church is being made known to the heavenly realms, which alone is, is amazing that we, through the church, proclaiming the mystery of Christ is telling spirits, okay, when we talk about heavenly realms, we're talking about spirits, maybe evil spirits, I don't know what spirits we're talking to here, but the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms are are learning this from the church according to, now don't miss this, this is the part, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the point. That's the point we miss because sometimes we focus a lot on what Paul is is doing and what Paul is saying about him being called and him being appointed least of all God's people, but appointed to preach to the Gentiles. We miss in this text, this part right here, where he says, according to his eternal purpose, now it's God's eternal purpose, which God accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. How long is eternity. Okay? How long is eternity? It's forever. When did eternity begin? Never. When does it end? Never. What was God's purpose in Christ? How long has God had his plan of salvation in Jesus? When did it start? It never did. When does it end? It never does. When did God come up with the plan for Jesus? Well, he's had it forever. So you mean that in the beginning, before Adam and Eve, God knew he would send Jesus to die for the sins of the people that he had not yet created? Yes, God preordained salvation since before time began. This is a nature of God. This is an attribute. This is something about God that we and the church have taught incorrectly a lot. If anyone tells you or if anyone says to you that God didn't know what was going to happen when he made Adam and Eve and that he had to come up with a plan B because Adam and Eve messed up the plan, the plan was for them to be perfect in the garden forever. No, they don't know God. They haven't read their Bible. They don't know Jesus. I don't even know what they're doing. I mean, because it's not, this isn't the only place where I'm about to make this point very clear through the book of Acts and see how that book of Acts teaches this in an amazing way. But Anyone who teaches that Jesus was plan B doesn't know God. Jesus was plan A. He was always plan A. Here's the thing about God being sovereign. When God is sovereign, he doesn't do plan Bs. That's what sovereign means. Sovereign means there are no plan Bs. There are no do-overs. There are no mistakes. There are no accidents. Okay, when when God is sovereign, there is nothing that happens that he did not know was going to happen beforehand and allow to happen for some purpose of his. Everything he is working out, even remember, even the wicked for a day of disaster. Proverbs 16, 
four, I believe. So when we look at Jesus, this has some monumental implications to your faith. God created Adam and Eve knowing they were going to fall. Or you could take it a step further and say God created Adam and Eve and allowed Satan to lead Adam and Eve to fall. Interesting. Very interesting. Look at this text from Acts as we go into some text on Acts. Look at God's role in salvation, okay? Think about this. This is what we're talking about, so don't get lost in all the sovereignty talk. We are focusing on God's role in salvation. So if you're taking notes, you write down, this is about God's role in salvation. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Okay, this is great. Great text, great proof text even. Okay, you can proof text this text all day long. Okay, because that text is always true, even out of context. <laughs> we must obey God rather than men. That's always true. Good one. But look at why he says this is true. Look at his, his evidence. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. I missed, an, I missed one, because this is God here, that God might give repentance and forgiveness of sins. Actually, no, hold on. As Jesus might give. That's why I didn't bold that. See, I start thinking in my own head, and sometimes I get confused. So God exalted Jesus to his right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Look at that. I mean, Peter, right here, three things that he says God does. God raised Jesus from the dead. God exalted him to his right hand. So God made Jesus Savior. That's what God did. God made Jesus Savior. And then God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. Every part of salvation was an act of God is an act of God. That's what I put. I think I wrote this originally with past tense, but then I was like, that's not the best way to think about it. Every part of salvation is an act of God. So even in the nature of Jesus being Savior, Jesus was made Savior by God. Jesus was raised from the dead by God. Jesus was sent by God. Jesus was told to do God's will. And that's what Jesus says. He says that the Father loved me because I did his will in John 15. Every part of salvation is an act of God. In Acts 13, 16 through 22, this is Paul. Now Paul gets in on it a little bit, okay, on the God as Savior uh, train. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. Okay, now as you listen, if you're not reading along, listen to the things God is doing. And this is going to lead us all the way up to Jesus. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. God made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt with mighty power. God led them out of that country. God endured their conduct for about 40 years in the desert. God overthrew seven nations in Canaan, and God gave their land to his people as their inheritance. All of this took 450 years. I love how Paul just throws that in there. Like, in case you're not counting, that was 450 years of history. I just gave you right there. 450 years, right there. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, the tribe of, from the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years after removing Saul. God made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. God has been active in carrying out every part of salvation since before time began. So when we open the Bible and we read any story about God at work, any part of God moving and working, we're seeing God bringing about the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. And, and nothing, nothing happened 
that God didn't want to happen. Okay, God has never said, oops. God has never said, oops. Okay, think about that. Think about if you could live a day and not say, oops. Just a day without doing something that you have to apologize for or say, oh, that oh, it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to turn out. Or, oh, yeah, I didn't mean to say that. Or, oh, I've got to apologize now. God has been in eternity and has never had to apologize. And not, that isn't even really my point. My point is that God has orchestrated eternity so perfectly to accomplish his goal through Jesus Christ that every single thing that happened, he he knew was going to happen, and it, and it worked into his plan, or it was him working his plan. And so he's never had to say, oops, didn't see that coming. And look at how Acts 13 continues. From this man's descendants, God has brought, referring to David, to Israel, the Savior Jesus, as he promised. Paul is getting in on this. God is Savior. God is Savior. God promised it. God orchestrated all the steps. He, he promised this it would happen. He promised us this would happen, and it did. Jumping down to 32, we tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled. Now, if you can't take that to the bank, folks, I don't know what you can. When we see the promises of God, those can be cashed in on right now. What God has promised, he will fulfill we, we see it throughout, I mean, there's a great passage in Isaiah 55 that says that the, the word of the Lord goes out and it will not return to him empty. It accomplishes every desire and every purpose for which he has sent it. It will not return to him void, but will achieve everything he has declared or everything that he has decreed and achieve every purpose for which he has sent it out. His word does everything that he says it should do. God didn't become Savior by accident. So when you think of Savior, God didn't become Savior, first of all. Okay, so let's, uh, that's why I put by accident in parentheses. Okay, this is important. This is a little theological notation. This would be accurate to say God did not become Savior, but I wanted you to understand that sometimes we think that, you know, Adam and Eve fell in the garden, oops, and now God sends Jesus, and now Jesus is Savior. Before he wasn't going to be Savior, now he's got to be Savior. God came up with a plan after the fact. He wasn't, now he is. That never happens with God. So I put become in, in quotes. God did not become Savior, so you could focus on the fact God doesn't become anything. Let that sink in for just a second. God does not become anything. He is. When he says his name is I am, it's because he is. Not because he is going to be something or was something or will be something. He is who he is. He was who he is and he will be who he is. He is. So when we say God is Savior, he's always been Savior. So that means that his plan from eternity was to create human humanity, to allow them to fall in the garden, and to save them through Jesus Christ. There, was not, there are no accidents with God, and God does not become anything because God does not change. And then in Acts 2, we see it again. This man was handed over to you, referring to Jesus, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. God even orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus. God planned it out. He knew Judas would betray him. Jesus picked Judas knowing Judas was going to be integral in the crucifixion. And yet God still holds these people responsible for their actions. So God preordained, if you will, Judas to be the betrayer, put him in the position to betray Jesus. He betrayed Jesus and God still holds him accountable for what he does. Because again, God, from from how I understand it, even with Pharaoh's hardening of his heart, God does not take someone and make them do something contrary to their nature. So if someone is by nature evil, God hardening that person's heart to betray Jesus or what the Romans did and how they accomplished God's purpose by crucifying Jesus, 
They didn't do anything contrary to their nature, but God encouraged them or hardened them or pushed them in the direction to do what God wanted them to do. And then we can get into the whole discussion, well, does that mean that God causes sin to happen? Well, in a way, when God, by his purpose, led the people to crucify Jesus, what they did was sin. But God is not held responsible. God, God, in what he did, didn't act against those people's nature. So again, they're responsible for their behavior, even if God was the one who initiated their act of crucifying Jesus. Okay? He goes on, And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead. And in the end, what I'm saying is that somehow or another, God allowed sin to happen so that he could send Jesus. His purpose was Jesus. In order for Jesus to need to come to save people from their sin, there had to be sin in the world. And, and frankly, if, if you haven't thought about it this far, when you look at the Garden of Eden scenario, how did the devil get in the garden in the first place? I mean, do you think Satan could have just walked into the garden without God opening the door for him? Do you think if God didn't want Satan to be there that all God had to do was say, Satan, no. And Satan wouldn't have been allowed within a million miles of the garden? I mean, Satan couldn't touch Job without God permitting Satan to deal with Job. And so God did allow that to happen because that's who God is and he is Savior and his purpose from the beginning of time was to save us through Jesus. Now, as we transition, let's ask this question. Because again, I'm not, I'm not going deeply into Jesus. I wanted you to focus on God's role in that. Now I want you to ask this question. Because first, you have to understand how God orchestrated salvation through Jesus and his eternal purpose in Christ was accomplished in what Jesus did. Now what about his eternal purpose for us? What about his purpose of salvation, of being Savior Does that apply outside of Jesus? Does God work as Savior in ways other than just Jesus? Meaning, when we look at who God is throughout the Old Testament, people who never knew Jesus, how was God Savior to them? And can He be Savior to us as well? I'm going to explain, okay? When we talk about the attributes of God, all of the attributes of God are infinite, not finite. When we talk about an attribute of God, infinite means it has, it's eternal. I should have used the word eternal because we've already talked about eternal. Then you would have a better idea of what I'm talking about. So when we look at God being Savior, in the same way, you've got to follow me here because I don't want to lose anybody. In the same way that God has always been Savior and in that has always planned for Jesus to come, God did not stop being Savior when Jesus completed what Jesus was sent to do. Jesus came for a purpose. That purpose was part of the plan. Okay? Part of the plan was the biggest, most important part of the plan was obviously that we can be saved from our sins and receive eternal life. But did God hang up his, his Savior hat? When Jesus ascended back into heaven and said, okay, I'm done being Savior. Or does God still work as Savior in our lives? The attributes of God are eternal, not finite. We look at God as sovereign. Okay, God is sovereign. Does that mean that he was sovereign and that at some point he stopped being that? No, of course, and we'd never say that. He's holy. Does he ever stop being holy? No. God's good. Does he ever stop being good? No. Does God ever stop being love? No. And we talked about how he applies his love to different people. He gives his love to certain people. He doesn't give it to other people, but that doesn't make him ever stop being love. God is light. Does he ever stop being light? No. Does he ever stop being righteous? No. Does he ever stop being jealous? Well, that's a good one. Because <laughs> I guess if all the people gave God every bit of praise that he deserved, God could stop being jealous. But that's not going to happen. So... When we look at God as Savior, we say this, 
He saved us by sending Jesus Christ. He saved us by sending Jesus Christ. Past tense. He saved us. And in the same way that we have a hang-up here about calling God Savior, we limit God's saving quality to be only regarding salvation from sin. Okay, so when I ask this question, how did God save us, your answer will be, He saved us from our sin. Okay? But is that it? God has an infinite attribute of being Savior. Does that mean he can only that does that mean the only thing God did for you was save you from your sin? Does that mean the only good God is, and of course there's a lot of good here, a lot of good, and some of us play that game where it's like, well, he saved me from my sin. That's enough for me. I'm gonna go on doing everything else I'm gonna do in the meantime. Is that all God is to us? Now that's a lot. Obviously, the gospel saves us from our sin, but then we continue in our Christian life throughout everything else we have to go through. And does God not show up as Savior in our life anymore? Does he not work as Savior in our life through those other things that we need saving from? When you ask, how is God saving you or how is God saving us, what would you say to that? When I came across this in my mind, I thought, wow. Look at the way I pray. Look at it compared to some of these texts that we're about to look at. Just, just go through the book of Psalms. I, I mean, I read Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And I'm like, wait a second. David's not referring to Jesus. In fact, no one in the Old Testament who refers to God as Savior is referring to Jesus. Yet they continually depend on God as Savior. So what am I missing? I'm missing some attribute of God that He wants to be in my life that I've written off because all I can see is that I've been saved from my sin and now God's done. That's, that's it. I miss how is God saving me now. I miss in my prayers praying, God, save me from my enemies, which is a common prayer of David. How many times do you pray that when you're having trouble at work, when you're having trouble in your, in your home or your family, or when Satan's attacking you and, you and you pray, well, God fix this, God do that, God do that. No, God save me from my enemies. How is God saving me now? We have lost sight of God's active saving work in our lives. Because as I start to look at God, it's so easy for me to preach a whole sermon on Jesus and us to be, and, and, and we are, we're awesomely excited about being saved from our sins. We would go to hell without it. Praise Jesus. He gets all the praise and all the glory. But what I'm saying is that it didn't stop. His saving work didn't stop with Jesus. It, it still goes on. The Holy Spirit and God working through the Holy Spirit still works salvation in our lives. But as Christians, as Christocentric, you know, meaning we focus exclusively on Christ and not so much on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has the power of salvation too. What has the Holy Spirit saved you from lately? Number one, what, what sins has the Holy Spirit saved you from lately? Not just saved in this gener just generalities, Saved from my sin. What specific sins has he saved you from? Because it's not just he writes off the whole debt and lets you continue living like a pagan. No, he writes off the debt and then he transforms you into the image of Jesus by saving you from every sin that you can commit individually. Now, how many of those sins have you prayed for God to save you from? Well, none. Because God stopped being Savior for me when I accepted Jesus. That's all I needed him for. No, God doesn't stop being your Savior. We've lost sight of God's active, saving work in our lives. So we need to understand. This is what I need to understand, because as I go through these lessons, remember, this is like for me, 
as much as it is for any of you, do I understand my need for a Savior? No, I don't. Because I think of God as was, not is. God was my Savior, not is my Savior. Or Jesus was my Savior. All the work that Jesus was going to do to save me, he did already. He's done. No. I need to change the tense from was to is. He is Savior. Meaning that when I go through these difficult trials in my life now, he is here to save me now. He is here to save me from my sins now, today. Not just wiping the debt clean and giving me credited righteousness so that I can go to heaven, but every day he saves me. Every day he is my Savior, not was my Savior. He is my Savior. And so what I have to do I have to wrap my mind around this idea of a continual need for the Savior and not deny it. Because again, as we've lost sight of God's active work, active saving work is how I put it, as we have lost sight of God's active saving work, we've also denied our continual need for a Savior. Okay? We, we isolate the work of Jesus to one event... And then you think that's all? You think Jesus would just die for you and just say, good luck, have fun, I'll see you in heaven. Good luck, you know, hope you, hope you do well out there. Watch out for the pothole. Uh, you know? No. He saves you and then he gets in you and walks with you, saving you every day. Our salvation really hasn't even come until we get to heaven until we get to that place where we have our perfected body and salvation is achieved. And in the meantime, Jesus didn't take vacation. Okay? And so we have to not, we have to stop denying or ignoring our continual need, our continual need for the Savior. This is a text I showed last week. I thought, wow, this came up again in my search as I was looking for texts and studying God being Savior. I talked about this last week, Jeshurun. I looked it up this week, found out that that's just another name for Israel. I was like, oh, that's helpful. So Israel is the metaphor here, and Song of Moses is what this is in Deuteronomy 32. And this is a pretty bad, again, another song we would never sing in church. Read the Song of Moses, because it's rough, man. He's just laying it out for Israel. But you'll get, a, you get the idea. We read this last week. Israel, if you will, grew fat and kicked. Filled with food, he became heavy and sleek. I don't know how the word sleek works in with heavy, but he abandoned the God who made him and rejected the rock, his savior. Because what has happened here is, is the people have turned to another savior other than God. What else would we do? Honestly, once we let God fall off of our radar as savior, what else are we going to do but find something else to be our savior? If God has stopped being your savior, you're going to fill that role with something. And that's what Israel did. Israel made God jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. So what do you turn to for salvation from stress, anxiety, insecurity, despair, grief, depression, financial difficulties, job Loss, hair loss, <laughs> whatever it might be, what do you turn to for salvation from the hard times in life? When you need saving, what do you turn to? What do we turn to? Anything that you turn to other than God, is an idol. Anything that you turn to other than God means that you've put that thing in the place of Savior in your life. So when it comes to money, when you turn to money to fix your problems, guess what your Savior is? Money. 
If you think, oh, if I just had a relationship, my life would be better. I would be saved from my loneliness if I just had a relationship. Guess what has become your savior? A relationship. Oh, if my kids could just behave, I wouldn't have so much, so many problems as a parent. So you turn to a self-help book or some parenting seminar or something, and you look to that to save you from the problems you're in. If I just had a promotion, if I just got a promotion, these things wouldn't happen. I, I would be saved from these financial problems that I'm in. Again, sort of like money, different, different way. No one notices me at the office. If I just had that desk in the corner, people would notice me. Who do you turn to for, for your Savior, as your Savior? We turn to all of these things because God has been taken off of the throne in our lives and his, his attribute, His nature of being our Savior has been lost. Isaiah goes on and on. I had so much text from Isaiah. Starting in 43. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overcome you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You can take that to the bank. That is a promise. You've got the sovereign God, Holy One, Savior. Talk about a resume. This is worth investing in. This is worth turning to. This God is Savior. He's our God. He goes on. I, even I, am the Lord. He's just really emphasizing. Look at me. And apart from me, there is no Savior. As much as you try to find saviors in the world, you won't, they won't save you. God has been Savior forever. There is only one. It is the Lord. Nothing else is going to help. Okay? You feel bad? Turn to whatever you think is going to help. It's not. It's not Savior. Your medication is not Savior. Drugs are not Savior. Therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists are not saviors. They can help. They won't heal. God is Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. I love this because what God is doing is he's pointing back to the things that he's already done that have proven himself. Now, Israel looks back mainly to the Passover and the 10 plagues being saved out of Egypt. And when God refers back to that, he says, look, I'm Savior. I am going to save you. For us, he looks back to Jesus. He says, look, God looks at us and he sees our problems. And he says, look, look at Jesus. I saved you then. I'll save you now. Why are you freaking out? I raised Jesus from the dead. You don't think I can handle this? Who do you think I am? I'm Savior. These foreign gods you're turning to, they're not going to do you any good. You're my witnesses. The church now, Israel then, is the witness that he is God. The witness of Christ is the testimony of God. So stop trying to to save yourself. This is part of salvation that we don't get as Americans. We want to save ourselves. We want to fix ourselves. We want to, we want to create whatever it is we need to create, find the fix, find whatever, so that we can say, oh yeah, I did it. I got out of this. Look at me, guys. I'm going to write a blog now, you know, so y'all can follow me and see how I beat my problems. I'm going to write a book, all right? So y'all can all pat me on the back. 
And what do people do? They boast in themselves because they think they've saved themselves. All they've really done is put on a good face and fake it for the world. God says, I'm, I alone am Savior, which is why he says, you boast in me alone. You don't boast in anything else but me because nothing else is God. Nothing else will save you. I will save you. Stop trying to save yourself. When it comes down to it, you just have to, you have, to just have a second of clarity. And maybe this message will go with you through the rest of your life. And when you get in those despairing situations, you'll have a moment of clarity where maybe you'll picture yourself in the Garden of Eden. Like, uh oh, this is bad. We just really messed up. Bad. Like, wait a second. Whose plan is better? I could try to get myself, I could try, I could be stupid like Adam and Eve and just go try to hide from God. A lot of good that did. Or I can think, just a moment of clarity, a second of clarity in your life where you say, whose plan is better? Whose plan is better? I could sit here and think up 99 ways to get out of my problems. It'd be 99 stupid plans. That's what you come up with. Unless you have a moment of clarity and think, whose plan is better, yours or God's? Whose plan is better? Who's going to work this out? Who's going to figure it out? Who's going to get you through? You? Ha! No. I've tried that one. It doesn't work. When it comes down to it, and I try to get myself out of my problems, I usually make them worse. When I try to put band-aids on, bullet holes, doesn't turn out very good for me. But when I have a moment of clarity and I think, okay, wait a second, I could come up with 99 plans to make this worse, or I could turn to the one whose plan never fails, the one who is Savior. Turn to Him, and I will be saved, just like Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. No, work really hard, make more money, have more responsibilities, spend less time with your family, neglect your wife, and you will find rest. Not. Chase the American dream. It'll end all your pro uh, probably make them worse. Jesus says, no, I'm Savior. Of course, God is Savior. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. My plan is for you to take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the plan of salvation, now and forever. Now and forever. Come to Him. It never expires, okay? It's not like... Tax-free weekend goes away. It's not like you got, a, you got two days, three days at most. Come to me during this time. You know, you better not miss it. No, this is a continual offer. The plan of us being saved now and forever. It's to continue on. Like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. You wonder what he means by that. I think he's referring to this problem I've revealed tonight about us turning to God as Savior for a one-time fix and then sort of ignoring him for the rest of our lives, taking his grace in vain, taking it like, I want to get to heaven, God, but then leave me alone. Or I needed you to get me to heaven. Now I don't really need you that much. Taking his grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. Now, if you don't read verse 2, you'll stop and you'll say, oh, that's referring to Jesus. Okay, the day of salvation was the day Jesus came. But again, you're reading this through the wrong lens. The salvation continues on, which is why Paul says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. You wake up in the morning, his mercies are new every morning. Every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my Father, it says, great is your faithfulness. I will say of the Lord, he is, he is my, my hope, my refuge. He's my fortress. He is everything. 
now is the day of salvation. So every day I wake up thinking God is going to save me from whatever trouble this day holds. Whatever trouble I'm going to face today, God is going to save me from it. He is going to save me now. When we look at him as Savior now, we look at him also as, as Savior forever. Isaiah 25 is a, is a great text to go to. Right in the middle in verse 9, it says, In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And this is written from the context of when you're in heaven, looking back down at your life. You'll say, look, we trusted him and he delivered us every time. When you look back on it from his perspective, you'll see how he delivered you from all of these things if you trust in him. It says, we trusted in him and he saved us. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Will you submit to his plan of salvation? It's really weird to say it like that because you think about that and you're like, oh wait, the plan of salvation, how to be saved, you know? If you're, you got your Church of Christ card in your pocket, you pull it out, it says, here, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, plan of salvation. Pull out a Baptist tract, plan of salvation. Oh, pray this prayer right here and you'll be saved, plan of salvation. Whatever, whatever, whatever. And that's not the only plan of salvation. God works his salvation continually in our lives. I read it just a minute ago. I'll, I'll remind, it to, remind you. There's, there's a couple texts first. I'll go to Hebrews 2 first. This is interesting. And bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things or everything exists, should make the author of their salvation, referring to us, make Jesus perfect through suffering. So God's plan for Jesus was that Jesus would be made perfect through suffering, which is a weird way to talk about someone who's perfect by nature. But in this sense, it's not perfect meaning you did something right or you did something wrong. It's perfect meaning complete. Perfect meaning fully finished. Okay? Uh, it is finished. When Jesus said on the cross, he, he said it is perfected. It just means it is finished. So in this sense, God's plan for Jesus, okay? I want you to see this. God's plan for Jesus, who's the author of our salvation, was for him to suffer. So not only do we have this idea in the Garden of Eden that will really mess with your mind if you sit and think about it long enough, now we have this idea, if God planned this all out, why did he plan for Jesus to suffer? Why did God make Jesus complete through suffering? Why would he do that? God could have just sent Jesus down, just ziplined him to the cross, and then just made it, you know, at least, you know... He could have maybe made it a little shorter, I don't know. Could have gone done without the scourging, done without the other suffering that he went through throughout his life. Why did Jesus why did he do this? Next verse. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. What that means is Jesus went through it because that's what we go through. God planned for Jesus to come down, and the plan was for Jesus to live a life like what we are going to go through. So that he could call us brothers, so that we could call him a brother. In Hebrews, it also says Jesus was made like us in every way. In every way. And so when we look at his suffering, we should see what God has planned for us. When we look at what God had planned for Jesus, we should not think that that is going to be any less than what he has planned for us. And so when we think about it, and when we need salvation, we turn to Jesus. We turn to the author of salvation. But we have to turn to him in a way that is true. And this is what's going to set us apart from a lot of people. Just this week, I saw another prosperity gospel preacher who said 
And he took a verse of context out, out of context from Revelation about Jesus having riches, referring to his riches in heaven, the riches that he left behind to come and be like us on earth. And he said, claim riches, claim riches in the name of Jesus. Jesus had riches, you should have riches too. Claim riches in the name of Jesus. As if he's trying to make a parallel between what God had planned for Jesus and what he has planned for us. And if Jesus had riches, then so should we. Well, that's weird because that's not what I see Jesus and that's not what I see God's plan for Jesus. And when I need to be saved, I turn to the author of my salvation, which is Jesus. And I look at God who is Savior and what the Savior had planned for the author of my salvation. What did God have planned for that? The key here is to reject lies of false teachers, for one. That's what you've got to walk away with. Ultimately, when people take Jesus and try to make him fix your problems, but in the end make Jesus another little idol that you put on yourself because they're making promises that Jesus didn't promise and, and they're trying to give you a life that Jesus didn't live, do you really think, I just want to say this to, to Osteen or somebody, do you really think God is going to make your life that much better than Jesus? Do you really think that God wants you to live on earth in so much luxury and comfort while Jesus was homeless? Do you really think that's God's plan for his people? For us to live in the upper class echelon of society and look down our noses at everybody. The false teachers take the plan out of context. When you look at the plan of salvation, you look to the author of salvation, you look at the text that is our theme text for our church, we preach Christ crucified. What does that mean? It means he was crucified. Am I taking that out of context? Anybody think I messed that up? Did I mess it up? Should we go back, check the record? We preach Christ crucified. What does that mean? He was crucified. Did I interpret that correctly? What does crucified mean? Penthouse suite? You know, AC? You know, 72 and sunny? He died, people. He died. Jesus died for us. He was brutally tortured and killed on the cross. When we preach Christ crucified, it's like, wake up, people. Jesus died for you. Do you think your life is going to be so much better than what God had planned for Jesus? I mean, what, what, what do we think when it's we preach Christ crucified? Our Savior went to the cross for us. What are we going to do for him? And so what is God's plan of salvation for us, our day-to-day -day plan? Look, I just read it. Mark it down. There's a great song called Do Not Fear. Awesome song. I sang it in youth group growing up as well. You know, when you pass through the waters, what does he say? I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Why? For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Wait a second, God. This doesn't sound like a saving text. If I went back and rewrote this text, it would say, When I didn't pass through the waters. When I didn't pass through the flood. When I didn't pass through the fire then I'll know you saved me because I didn't go through any of it, right? It's not what he says. Here's the point. Salvation does not equal prevention. Salvation does not equal prevention. We have the model of Jesus and then we have the model in our life. We wake up today and we say, God, save me from my troubles. Now, if you think for a second you'll have no trouble that day, then you're totally misled. The difference is, save me from my troubles today means that every trouble I go through, God will walk with me through every bit of it. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. And I will make it through today because He is my Savior. I will make it through today. That is the plan of salvation. Not to prevent trials. Salvation is not prevention. God is not promising prevention of trials. It's not to prevent suffering. Jesus suffered. And that was God's plan for him. 
but it's to walk with us through them. To walk with us through them. I have two last texts. I want you to write down Habakkuk. Habakkuk is an amazing minor prophet. It's a very sad book. Lots of bad things happening to Israel. And it ends this way. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows. At the lightning of your flashing spear, in wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Selah. With his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Oh, okay. Sounds like some days you've gone through. But look at how this turns out for those who look to God as Savior. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come upon the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, this is as bad as it gets, we're bankrupt, we're starving, and there's nothing good at all going on right now, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. That is what salvation looks like. The earth is burning around you. The world is coming to an end. I wouldn't be surprised if America was the next Sodom and Gomorrah with the way things are turning out. But we rejoice in the Lord. We're joyful in God our Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. In the midst of all this, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. What? an awesome passage. What a passage that truly, truly communicates what God's plan of salvation is for us. To give us the strength to overcome anything, not to prevent us from going through anything. That's why in Philippians 1.29 it says, for it has been granted to you, meaning it has been given, it has been promised, it has been guaranteed not only to believe on Christ, but also to suffer for Him. Also to suffer for Him. And we go through it with joy. We rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in them because they produce perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. In the end, church God is in the business of saving people. God is in the business. That's what he does. On his door, Savior. All right? I'm going to go to God, my Savior. I'm going to call up a Savior. I'm going to phone a friend who's a Savior. I'm going to call God. He's a Savior. So my job is to let him do his job. To let him save me. I'm done with trying to work myself out of bad situations. I'm done trying to get me a pick-me-up or find something else to look forward to. Another vacation that's just going to come and go. Another thing that's just going to break another conflict that's just going to come back again, I'm going to look to God as my Savior and let Him redeem me from the pit. Lift me out of the pit. Look at Psalms this week. Study all the ways David turns to God as Savior. It's powerful. Way too many texts. Psalm 27 is one of the best to go to. 